Okay, so thank you all so much for being here and welcome to the July uh, APCG online colloquium. So today we have uh, the paper, The Influences of Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation on Constitutional Change and Governance in Kenya, and that's by Ruth Marumba. And Ruth is a PhD candidate at Moy University. Um, Ruth, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Really appreciate it. Um, we're also lucky to have two great discussants with us. So first we have Ken Apollo, who's an assistant professor at Georgetown University. Um, his research focuses on institutions and the politics of development, including a focus on legislative development, as well as subnational administration and governance in Kenya. Um, we also have with us Adrian Laba, who's an associate professor at American University. And her research focuses on social movements, political parties, and democratization across Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm Alicia Perisky. I'm one of the APCG online colloquium organizers, and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. So what we're going to do basically is start with, with Ruth giving us a quick five minute overview to the paper background, maybe your goals for the paper. And then we'll turn first to Ken for your discussions and Ken will have 10 to 15 uh, minutes to give us his feedback. And then we'll turn to Adrian's feedback. Um, and we'll then give Ruth a chance to respond to both Ken and Adrian's feedback before opening up the discussion to everyone else. So we have many people joining us today, which is fantastic. I just ask that you mute your microphones when you're not speaking. Um, and when it comes time to open discussion, I'll, I'll open it up through the, through the comments. So Ruth, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to do it, but let me just begin by saying, uh, uh, what motivated my my thinking on uh, on what Einstein's ladder means for um, maybe a devolution or constitutional change and citizen participation in Kenya is uh, my own research for my PhD, which I'm currently carrying out um, uh, in uh, in Nairobi. So I wanted to see whether uh, the model uh, actually uh, would work, has any influence on how governance is carried out maybe in urban settings as well as rural, uh, maybe hairy urban or rural settings. So in that, that is uh, my, my main motivation to see its influence on the concept of uh, devolution and citizen participation in Kenya. So, um, I was looking at uh, maybe a material a secondary data that's available about um, Einstein's ladder and its influence on how uh, administration and uh, the whole idea of citizen participation is understood in the Kenyan uh, perspective. So that led me to our whole idea of uh, a two-tier system where we have a national government, how a county understood the whole idea of uh, uh, operationalizing, making the whole idea of citizen participation make sense right down to the village level, which is what uh, influenced my, my, my thinking on this whole paper. And after all that work that was done by those who came earlier, Professor Yashpal Gai and others, Maybe uh, I ended up at on the county of Makweni because uh, the current governor of Makweni is kind of one of those people who were really active in the whole idea of devolution and participation of the citizen right down to the uh, local level. So that's, that is what influenced uh, my work. So um, I was thinking about it in such a way that how does that person at the village level uh, gets to take part in the kind of change they want. 
how is it done and can it be attributed to the knowledge that we've gained from from Anson's ladder so basically uh, that's what I was looking at so using McQueney maybe as a frame as a lens through which uh, to drive my my thinking on the whole idea of uh, citizen participation so that's how I ended up uh, looking at that paper at that county and um, maybe writing something a little bit about what I came up with and how it all works but of course it's not a perfect uh, picture. There's some weaknesses, of course, where people still feel disenfranchised. They don't understand what's going on. Maybe they're not able to feel they are fully engaged. But again, the question is, how do you fully engage someone as a citizen in, in participation? So yeah, that's what I was looking at. And then I'm, I have no idea about where I would know I would pu publish because it's really just uh idea an idea that i had so uh, it's just at at that point yeah so basically i'm still at the idea draft i don't think it's a complete thing because i was still thinking about what if i make comparisons between two uh two counties another county as well just to see whether um, it makes any sense and whether it's really something that has an attributable effect on how uh, constitutional change and governance is understood at the county level. So I'm I'm still at I'm still at that point where I'm trying to to see what what kind of feedback I can I can get like where I would publish the paper as well as um, what whether they think uh, the discussants think my my work makes any sense or <laughs> it's just a disjointed piece of <laughs> of ideas and maybe yeah just to gain uh some fresh insight on on what my my paper looks like yeah thank you thank you so much Ruth. ken i'll turn it over to you for for comments you uh ruth thank you thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, uh your paper uh at this early stage uh, you address a, a very important question, which is, uh, you know, you know, what's the role of citizen participation, and and uh, is it working under devolution in Kenya? And I, I think I think the paper has 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 legs and uh, and can be improved uh, to a point where you, uh, you would be able to send it for publication to a journal. Um, you know, the 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 first thing that I got reading the paper is that uh, perhaps by front loading uh, this idea of Einstein's ladder, you're narrowing the scope of the paper too much. Uh, uh, I, I think, you know, you should just have a, a bigger uh, a question about devolution and citizen participation, uh, right? So uh, you, you briefly we outlined some of the history of uh, subnational governance in Kenya and the fact that, you know, uh, the clamor for Majimbo or devolution uh, uh, has always been part of Kenyan politics. And that a key motivation for that was uh, to increase local participation uh, in policy making and in determining uh, the allocation of resources. Uh, so uh, uh, that gives you a very rich uh, a, a array of material to work with in terms of, you know, what do citizens actually know about this and what do they expect uh, about this? And, and so by uh, sort of asking a generic question about citizen participation uh, and also elite perceptions of what that means, uh, you could expand the scope of the paper to make it a lot more uh, uh, open to uh, more interesting analysis, uh, in, in, in my view. And so, uh, to make that happen, I think, uh, uh, you could do uh, a few things. One is have a clear sort of articulation of, uh, what the aspiration of devolution was. Uh, so, uh, increasing citizen participation, increasing, um, local input on development. All right. Uh, the law is actually very clear that development spending has to be at least 30% of, of, of the budget. Uh, 
Then having said that, you can then ask the question, um, you know, what's the nature of local participation? Uh, do we know uh, if citizens actually know what this means, uh, right? Now, uh, you know, this survey work uh, that I've done, which uh, tends to show that, you know, citizens actually don't seem to care much about which TO government is doing what. Uh, citizens just want uh, good public goods and services. Uh, now, health appears to be a lot more salient as a county function than other functions. Um, and so by, again, opening up the, uh, the research question, uh, you can begin to interrogate some of the inconsistencies uh, between the expectation of citizen participation and the political knowledge among citizens, uh, that, uh, 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 in, which has a bearing on whether they can participate meaningfully. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, you, you could address is the question of, you know, does it really make sense to participate, uh, right? Are we asking too much of citizens uh, in the Kenyan constitution? Because you can imagine that, you know, uh, rational people will only show up to participate if they know that they'll get something out of it. If the experience is that participation is not accompanied by any tangible outcomes, then uh, it's not clear why people would continue to participate uh, unless, you know, you're making claims that there's some intrinsic value in participation and people and that people ought to or will participate regardless of the outcomes. Uh, and again, you know, in the Kenyan context, it appears to be that, and uh, I think you're on the right track because the survey data shows this, right? So uh, in it, looking at the survey data, Makueni in particular has the highest rates of citizen participation in part because we know that in Makueni, the governor actually listens and, and responds to citizens. So you can already see that you know, participation is correlated with uh, some expectation of outcomes from participation. And so again, uh, you, know, you, can, you can clearly tell us uh, what participation was supposed to do, what kind of citizen, uh, right? What are the sort of uh, civic competencies that we expect among citizens to enable them to participate well? Um, and then, and then lastly, uh, you know, what are the elite perceptions of what's going on, uh, right? So you can imagine that there are some governors, like the governor of Makueni, who like participation, and there are others that don't, right? Uh, and uh, just, you know, from speaking to governors and MCAs, uh, uh, especially if you talk to, like, uh, minority MCAs, they'll tell you that, you know, most counties have a list of people that are invited to participate. Uh, and that, you know, uh, governors often try to keep away trouble, uh, troublemakers during these public participation events. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it would be also nice to tell us, you know, it's, it's not just the case that everyone is trying to implement the constitution in good faith, people are maximizing uh, different things conditional on the uh, institutional background provided by the constitution. Uh, which, which brings me to uh, you know, a point I wanted to make about your research design. I think you undersell what you're doing here because you know, Kenya has a very unique context in the sense that the constitution requires participation, uh, right? There are actual cases uh, where you know, courts annulled laws that were passed without adequate participation. So, you know, you have this national background of a constitutionally mandated participation. Uh, and so what you're observing is variation within this national mandate. And I think you can, yeah, you can foreground that and, and make it clear that, you know, this is not, you know, these counties are required to do this and most of them, you know, try to meet the minimum threshold. Uh, and so what you're measuring or trying to uh, uncover is the extent to which uh, that is actually meaningfully done at the grassroots level. Um, okay, so, so that, that's about, you know, uh, those are some thoughts I had about the sort of nuts and bolts of the context uh, and, and how you can design a research uh, uh, agenda around them. Uh, I, think, I think you should definitely play the constitutional angle and, and make it clear that this was something that's mandated and that counties actually are doing it. Uh, the question is how and to what extent are they doing it meaningfully? 
Um, then the next set of comments are about presentation and, and the structure of the paper. Uh, I think I think from the get go, uh, uh, you should give the, the reader an idea of, of uh, your primary question and where you're going with the paper and the evidence that you present uh, in support of the argument. Um, uh, you, you probably also need a little bit more justification and, and I'm glad you're already thinking about uh, justifying why Makoemi and perhaps thinking of a comparative case because you know uh, Makoeni is is an outlier in this regard, although I shouldn't say outlier. Uh, so the survey results that I have yeah, show that Makoeni is better than most counties, but places like Wasinigishu, Kakamega are not that far behind in terms of citizen perceptions of public participation and 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 the performance of governors. So you could do you could do a comparison across party lines. So you know, opposition Makoeni. Uh, perhaps a jubilee or a set of jubilee counties. Uh, you could do it by region. Uh, you could do it by governor types, uh, right? So we know that governors in Kisumu, Makueni, and to some extent Kitui sort of have an ideological leaning uh, that uh, predisposes them to be better at this than uh, the more sort of right of center governors who are just about development and don't care much about citizen mobilization. So you, 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 you could cut this uh, in multiple ways and provide justifications for your comparison. Uh, the other point I had is that uh, throughout the paper, there seems to be slippage between analyses and policy prescriptions. Uh, I, I think you should uh, keep those separate uh, and, and have the analysis sections be just that. And then uh, maybe uh, table the policy pre prescriptions to the end. Um, and then, you know, again, just to emphasize, I think you should you should play to the strengths of the paper, which is uh, this idea that is a an, a history of demand for subnational self government, uh, and part of that package came with the resources and a constitutional mandate for local participation. And that you know you have 47 units that are mandated to do this, and what you're doing now is looking at how that's playing out uh, with a focus on a few case studies. And so the the paper, uh, I think the paper could do with a lot more of like the Kenya picture, uh, because your canvas is the Kenya picture, uh, and what you're giving us is a snapshot of it, but with this background in mind. Uh, and and also just to emphasize this further, you know, uh, keeping track of the, the key players and the incentives and interests, right? Citizens, uh, the politicians, uh, and then of course, uh, the constitution is backed by the judiciary. Uh, and, and making it clear that, you know, uh, the call for participation in Kenya is not just window dressing and that the activists who, who continue to sue governors and the national government uh, for not meeting the constitutional threshold for uh, citizen participation. I'll stop with that. Great, thanks so much, Ken. Um, Adrian, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, great. So first of all, I, I really enjoyed uh, this paper. And I think that you're asking a really important question, which is how do citizens become involved in the process of government decision-making? And even though this constitution is 10 years old, I, I don't think that we know very much about the ways in which citizens interact with all of these new institutions that have been created, particularly those at the lower level, which you discuss in the case of, of, of McQueen uh, County. Um, you know, you mentioned in your introductory comments that some of the citizens feel sort of disenfranchised or they don't really even in McQuinney maybe, don't feel fully engaged. And so I think that, you know, that would be the direction as you're gonna see that I'm gonna push you in, in terms of building out the empirical portion of the, of the paper. And I think that, you know, Ken is, is giving you one option. I'm gonna maybe give you a different option in terms of where you wanna go with the paper. But uh, let me start out by talking about Arnstein's ladder of participation a little bit. Um, I admit that I had to Google this, and so, you know, if you're going to use this as your main theoretical framework, you, you sort of want to build it out, and it, it almost sounded as if this is used commonly within Kenya and may even have guided some of the discussions around um, 
the drafting of the Constitution. And so I think that makes it even more interesting to sort of build out, you know, this is the institutions were designed in, with this in mind. And so it's, it's really interesting to then use it as a metric for, um, for measuring um, progress and citizen empowerment. Uh, but another reason that I like it is because, you know, based on my Googling, it establishes these really clear steps, you know, this, this multiple different levels that you can get to in terms of citizen empowerment. And so this can, you know, lead all the way from manipulation. And I think if we think of a lot of the authoritarian regimes in Africa, they did have participation, right? But it was a particularly channeled form of participation. So, you know, it starts out with manipulation to just informing your citizens, to tokenistic consultation, to genuine partnership, and eventually to citizen control. I think it, when you're building this out in the theoretical section, you could talk a little bit more about what would we expect to see at each of those levels? Like what are the indicators that you've gotten to one stage rather than another? Um, because I think you have clear ideas that are sort of embedded throughout the paper, but they're not really clearly specified in a way that someone uh, unfamiliar with this concept would really be able to follow. Um, so I think that the argument that you're making in the paper is that uh, the 2010 con Constitution first established these formal institutional requirements that should have pushed up Arnstein's ladder. Uh, but I think but the, there's been uneven performance, but I think you're also arguing that in McQuinney, you actually have reached a much higher level on Arnstein's ladder than in other counties. And I think if you're going to do that, then there needs to be a lot more on how these institutions are perceived by citizens, how citizens are using them. So what kinds of issues are coming up through these grassroots structures into the MCAs? And then also maybe a little bit of discussion of the actual outputs, because if we're, if we're moving up to sort of greater citizen involvement, then we need to see the impact of citizen voices on actual policy outcomes. So I sort of have three major comments, and then I'm gonna push you in a much larger direction Maybe not for this paper, but I'm thinking, you know, as you build out your research agenda, I think there are two different directions you should you could go with this focus on, on devolution and its impacts. So to start out with my main comments, uh, you know, I was excited when you got to the case of McQuinney. Um, because I was like, great, this is going to be like these citizen voices and we're going to learn more about how citizens are perceiving this. Um, but then we hear a lot about institutions. And I think that this is one of the, the sort of um, tensions in the paper right now, is that you want to talk about citizens' involvement in the process, but you spend a lot of time talking about the actual institutions, the establishment of the institutions, you know, how far down they go. Um, so I think it, particularly when you get to the case of McQuaney, I wanted to hear just a lot more about ordinary citizens and um, including those who participated in the village forums and the village cluster development committees, because those, I know almost nothing about those institutions. You know, you read a little bit about um, the county assemblies, but certainly I, I don't know a lot about what participation looks like at the county level and certainly below the county level. So, um, you know, those people who participated, but it would also be interesting to hear the views of maybe those people who didn't participate. I think one of the real questions, particularly given that people aren't just born in this new context, right? They have past experiences of the state, past experiences of politics, and certainly my experience uh, doing fieldwork in Kenya has been sort of profound disillusionment with government. And so it would be interesting to sort of know the citizens at the local level, which ones participate, which ones opt out, how are they learning, you know, did people get very excited about these new institutions, and then maybe they get disillusioned really fast. Um, so, you know, I think the more you can flesh out in terms of how citizens are actually interacting with these institutions, the better. And I know that it's, it's often prohibitive to go and, and do a sustained period of field work, um, but, you know, I think that, you know, just going and maybe focusing on a small number of um, 
of wards or focusing, you know, just on maybe even one cluster of villages would give us a lot that you could sort of get through in the paper. Um, so in terms of this question that Ken raised about uh, comparison or staying focused on McQuaney, I think you can go either this. So certainly if you're going to focus more on the institutional variation and maybe rely much more heavily on desk research, I think there's a lot you can do with comparisons across counties. And you can possibly also look at some of the survey data that others have collected, notably the upper barometer, that would give us a sort of sense of maybe a gap between trust in local institutions and trust in national institutions at the county level. But I think if you want this to be a McQuaney paper, it, it can totally be a McQuaney paper. Um, and I think that there have been some articles published in Journal of Eastern African Studies um, recently that have just been county papers. And I find those really interesting. And so, you know, I think that there would be a lot of demand for understanding what is happening at the county level, even if it is an outlier. You know, you could sort of pitch it as this is a place where, you know, the institutions are functioning it's almost an exemplary case. And then you could pull out how citizens feel even inside those institutions. So maybe you find there's there's sort of tension or there are these feelings of disenfranchisement even in the exemplary case. And I think that could be really interesting. Another question I had about the case selection is you cite this World Bank participatory budgeting process in McQueney. And I have to say that that's the only thing that I had I'd known about McQueenie and devolution going into this. I was really interested in whether the World Bank, I mean, I've heard from Ken, I think that maybe it's the progressive governor, but I was also wondering how far the World Bank had sort of pushed McQueenie in this direction of institutionalizing participation. Um, so certainly maybe talk about that a bit. Okay, second major comment uh, on Arnstein's uh, ladder. My big question about this was how the stages are connected to one another. So in other words, if you're a citizen, do you need to move through these stages in order to get to higher stages of citizen involvement? So, you know, one of the real uh, stumbling blocks for citizen inclusion is just going to be knowledge and expertise, right? And so I did wonder whether you need a sustained program of civic education in order for people to really understand these institutions. And then even if they have some awareness of institutions, I was worried about power differentials inside these institutions. So we certainly know at the county assembly level that some voices are louder than others. And I just imagine that that would sort of be reflected all the way down. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like a little bit more thinking about, you know, the role that information and knowledge and expertise plays inside these institutions. The second thing that I wanted to know more about was, you know, who is organized? So, you know, like, have these institutions sort of spurred a process of greater civic uh, organization? Um, there's a really great, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a really great uh, piece by Duncan Amonga on Nakuru in the Journal of Eastern African Studies. I came across some of his work and then went and read all of it. And um, his, his uh, paper on Nakuru talks about the role of WhatsApp groups and sort of giving people information, but then getting them from, to, to move from this sort of WhatsApp online activism to in-person activism or in-person participation. So I think that some attention to networks that pull people into these uh, institutions and whether those networks are really inclusive, I think that that could be a huge contribution. Okay, and then the third, oh, and I did also want to mention on this, I don't know if you're aware that the International uh, Republican Institute, IRI, has for several years now had a big program on uh, Kenyan counties. And one of the um, initiatives on that was the use of this SMS platform for spreading information and also receiving citizen complaints. Um, I don't know if that's been rolled out in Makweni. I don't know where it's been rolled out. I know that they've been doing a lot of work with it in Isiolo. 
So, you know, maybe looking at IRI or even getting in touch with some of the IRI staff and, and talking to them about this issue of sort of networks and participation and, and um, organization would be interesting. Okay, the third big comment, uh, the way that you've set up this paper is sort of sequential, where you start off in the authoritarian period, and then you talk about the constitution making during the multi-party period, and then you talk about uh, what goes on after devolution. I think in each of those stages, I would want you to be a little bit more explicit about how citizens are experiencing government. So in the authoritarian period, we have these district development committees. I know really very little about those. So you know how active were they? How much scope did they have? Did citizens see them as accountable in any way or were they seen as a tool of you know, the central government? But then you also have, and this is you know, huge in the Kenyan uh, literature, um, you have Harambe, right, which is supposed to be both participatory, but is also mobilizing citizen resources. And so in some ways, I think a reader is going to expect citizens to already have high levels of participation, um, even in the authoritarian period. And I think you just got to tell us where you stand on that. Is that true? Is that not? Um, and then also during the constitutional bargaining period, who is actually involved in shaping that process? How participatory is it? Who are the civil society actors who are involved? And can we speak of them as having real links to the grassroots? Okay, I have a, a couple more minutes. So let me, um, so those are the main sort of substantive points I had on the paper. And then uh, I just wanted to sort of raise two bigger questions that you can maybe think about both when you're revising this paper, but also as you, you know, keep doing more research. Um, I, I think all of us probably on this call have this normative commitment to greater citizen involvement in government. Like we think it's a good thing, right? We want citizens to be involved just because we think that's what democracy is. But I think that you still need to give us an answer for why it's important, right? So like, if these citizens become super involved and if you have these really active grassroots institutions, what does that actually get us? Um, so I think that there are two ways that you could um, push. And I think that, you know, to the extent that you can get your research to engage with one of these two questions, you can make a much bigger uh, contribution beyond Kenya. Uh, so the first is, um, is decentralization good or bad for policy and development outcomes? So I think that this has been the dominant political science approach to why we want decentralization. The idea here is that citizens, if they're informed and if they're empowered, they can keep officials, elected officials accountable, right? And they can force elected uh, officials to obey their preferences on development policy and all of the rest. And so I think that's the classic, is decentralization good or bad? That's sort of pitting these decentralized institutions against more centralized um, government institutions and asking which is better for development and which is better for accountability. I think that's one big debate. A second debate is just how do citizens feel about government? And so, you know, regardless of what policies come out of it, um, does this kind of more inclusive participation maybe build greater citizen trust in institutions? Or um, I don't know if you know, but I've been doing a lot of work on taxation. And so, you know, whenever I think about this question, I think about voluntary compliance with tax. And this is a really important question for the counties, right? Because in many ways, the counties are unfunded mandates. Like they're still reliant on those central government transfers. And so if involving your citizens in participation makes them more likely to pay small taxes to the county government, then that is a really important um, you know, outcome, regardless of whether they're getting better policy or better services. So I think that these are two really different questions. And I would just be really interested to, think, to hear your thoughts on either of them. And I, I have a whole bunch more. Um, I wrote too many, so I'll send them to you. Thank you so much. Um, 
Ruth, I just want to give you a few minutes to respond uh, and discuss. You can take that if you like, or we can open up to questions. But uh, you know, if you have questions or, or comments, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> I feel uh, validated to some extent. <laughs> At least I feel like my work makes uh, uh, some sense. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to to go through my paper. I appreciate the, the comments. Hopefully I can work on the draft and maybe uh, ask for their further uh, assistance on it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I want to then open it up to broader discussion from, from everyone else. So if you have a question, just maybe write in the chat that you would like, and I'll just call on you and open up so you can ask your question. So, someone. So, uh, <clears throat> Ruth, as, as we're waiting for the question, um, uh, a comment, and I, uh, I'll, I'll send you my written comments as well. A comment that I had mm -hmm. was also that uh, the other thing you could leverage uh, within Kenya is this, uh, sort of division of labor between national and county governments. Uh, so that's something that I've been trying to explore uh, in my own work uh, because, you know, it, uh, the participation architecture in Kenya actually demands a lot of citizens uh, that you should know, you know, who's responsible for agriculture, healthcare, education, and even within those, you know, Within education, you have, you know, pre-primary education is a county function. The rest is a national function. Tertiary is a county function. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And so uh, you could leverage something like healthcare where there's very, there's a lot more clarity on healthcare being a county function. These are, these are the sectors that are shared and blurry between national and county governments. Uh, and so, uh, and I totally agree with Adrian's comment that you could choose to dig deeper into Makweni, uh, and, and as you're doing that, you know, see whether citizens respond differently or engage uh, differently across different sectors, conditional on the clarity of responsibility, and therefore attribution uh, 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 across the different sectors. And I, I think, you know, healthcare being the, the very big obvious one uh, would be a place to focus on. Can I jump in real quick on that? Um, the, so I've been doing a lot of work for several years now in Nigeria, and I think one of the really interesting things about attribution of services in Nigeria, because it's also a federal tiered system, where there's a very confusing division of labor on services. And so even in health, hospitals are state, but clinics are local government. Mm -hmm. And so um, people are very confused about the attribution, but one of the interesting things that happens, and I would be curious to see whether this happens in Kenya as well, is that you get these technocratic governors who wanna build a brand. And one of the ways that they build a brand for themselves is basically to usurp the powers of the lower level and take over services delivery that's supposed to be done on a, on a lower level. And so I don't know if the wards are given any powers or any responsibility for services delivery, but you know that dynamic could play out between states and wards or it could play out between the central government and states. If you have a poorly performing state, a central um, figure could, you know, maybe even an MP could sort of try to usurp some of the powers of the poorly performing uh, county. Um, so Eve had a, had a question. Yeah, I've, I've got a, um, I've got one <clears throat> kind of lawyer Larger question, and then a <clears throat> two smaller uh, uh, follow-ups. One is if you were to compare uh, a couple of counties, I was wondering not only if you could address uh, what kinds of activities the citizens were organizing around, but if you were to choose a county that in which the, um, the citizens were either in different political camps or under different kinds of uh, county governance, if you could see the kinds of demands that, that citizens were making and see if they vary 
Um, and if you only did two, that would be difficult. But at least if you if you were to do four and you got two and two similarities, that might be interesting to see um, if there were certain needs that weren't being addressed when you had a very uh, technocratic development oriented group versus one that was participatory. So that was my first question. Um, if you had any insight into that, but then on a on on the other uh, two little follow-ups, and this really comes. I have to confess, I spent two terms on city council, so this really comes from someone who worked at the local level, and we have a very uh, um, uh, how shall I say contentious community with lots of people running for city council and lots of opinions. And one of the things that uh, helps or does not help um, participation is the resources available. If people wanna do things, but you have no resources. So I wanted to see more about the budgets at the local level at, and, and whether they were, how much discretion there was for shifting those budgets, whether they were um, line items that have to get paid but but what what are people contending over? What kind of resources are there uh, for making decisions? And that leads me to another piece, which is that uh, as I was reading your paper, and I have to say I found your paper fascinating. I have I have I have visited Kenya. I've not worked in Kenya. I've worked in Zambia and Namibia and and uh, and and uh, Jordan and, and Morocco and places like that. But um, at the local level, uh, th there. I have found two kinds of phenomena. I mean, um, sometimes there, is, there are people who set up a dynamic that at the national level you won't be represented and at the local level somehow everyone will be represented because it's closer to the grassroots. But there are contentious groups. People do, are not in agreement <laughs> in what they want at the local level. There is bitter, bitter fighting and contentiousness at the local level. And you mentioned in your paper, I was happy See where you talked about some of the obstacles of um, uh, to the local level um, for uh, hijacking uh, democratic participation, uh, and I was glad to see you didn't have that um, uh, quite as strong a dynamic about the local level is good, the the national level is is not. But I'd like to see you flesh flesh that out more because uh, in some cases there are local bosses and the local bosses say things and people are afraid to come forward uh, and speak otherwise uh, because they may be relying on them for, for, for a variety of goods, services, jobs, connections, who knows. And I didn't see any discussion of that. It, it seemed to be, you, 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 you gave a line or two about what could be some of the obstacles at the local level, but I'd like to see it more addressed uh, to what extent are there democratic practices and to what extent are these other forces um, prohibiting or mitigating any kinds of democratic uh, participation? So thank you. Thanks, Eve. Um, Ruth, I'm just going to take one more question and then give you a chance to okay. respond to those. So Sarah okay. Brierley, I think, had a question. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Ruth, for sharing your paper. Um, I also really enjoyed reading it. I think my comment actually follows on really nicely from what you're saying, because that's what I kept thinking. The resource question was what I kept thinking reading it. Um, because I work, um, I study local governments in the context of Ghana, and there's a lot of uh, political will to get communities more involved with all kinds of aspects of local government governance, um, particularly kind of project planning, where local public goods are going to be built, etc. But for local governments to get citizen participation, they either need to go to communities or they need to get community members to come to them. And both of those things are quite costly. You know, even going to communities, you have to fuel vehicles, you have to, you know, you have to service your cars and da 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 or get people to come to you you have to pay for meetings you have to pay for refreshments da 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 so i think yeah um this kind of the financial uh hinder you know the financial constraints i think is really important um 
and needs to sort of be expanded on in the paper. And I think, especially if you take on, you know, Ken's suggestion of opening your question up to be kind of what um, hinders citizen participation and use your case study of how that county has been able to overcome these problems. Um, so yeah, if you if you frame it like a what hinders citizen participation, uh, you're saying that it's definitely not a lack of rights because the rights are there in the constitution. So it must be some other factor. So then I thought, you know, surely then finances might have to come in. Uh, some so yeah, uh, I don't know if if uh, if that's just. Uh, a part of the essay that is to come in later work maybe um or i mean in a later draft that you would write a bit more about resources um but yeah i i, I wanted to see a bit more on that but thanks a lot for uh sharing this draft with us thanks so much ruth i'll give you a chance to to maybe address those questions okay um thank you uh i think eve was talking about um Something about uh, what kind of activities are they organizing around? Uh, so it would depend on the, okay, like McQueney is actually more arid and semi-arid. So I guess the basic issues would be about water, maybe healthcare and roads. So uh, for up to the, to the most uh, basic level at the village, I, I'm having visited the county, I would say, Issues would be around water and the distance it would take maybe for people to access water. So probably issues of gender uh, empowerment and all would come in there. How long it takes for women to go and uh, access water? How long it would take someone to get to a hospital? Those would be some of the issues that uh, they are organizing around. And uh, as Professor Ken noted, okay, like the governor of Makweni is quite, uh, like um, progressive in his ideas, probably because he's a professor as well, uh, and of also of politics. So many of his ideas <laughs> are are around the same. So he sees it um, maybe in a better way than someone else who doesn't have a background of the same. So it's easier for him to um, to differentiate it right down to the local level. I've seen a, a comment from Franklin Muzomi. He's saying something about uh, it's not the quality of the devolution, but actually trying to get it as far as, um, as much as possible to, to the local person. So that's probably what, what goes on. So of course, I think uh, the demands would vary probably in the more urban areas of the county and the more rural areas of the county. If you think about maybe the towns along the Nairobi Mombasa Highway, those ones maybe what they would want from devolution would be probably different from what a person in Makindu in the village would would want. So of course, uh, I think they would vary. And then uh, if you talk about like budgeting and resources, uh, if you there's okay, there's a lot of information. I think probably something I should add to my paper, but. Uh, they always get like unqualified uh, results from the Auditor General because they are very good at making sure that uh, the kind of demands and needs that people need uh, actually come from the grassroots all the way up. So in that way, if you have like a funnel, you know, from the bottom to the top, all the needs that uh, people have, uh, have somehow are prioritize and find their way to the top. So there's a lot of uh, participation, actually, as has been noted by some of the comments here. So there's not much issue on that because I think uh, maybe because of the work they've done, they, they try to make sure that they prioritize what, they, what people want by asking them what they really need uh, in order of uh, priority. Do we begin with this one? or that one. I think that's how it works for them. So, uh, of course, there are always contentions. Uh, this governor is in his second term. In his first term, he faced a very difficult uh, situation. They almost dissolved the county. 
and somehow he managed to get to the election time and all the uh, members of the county assemblies, the MCAs who were kind of problematic, find out, found their way out. And only one was voted back in the new, in the new team. So somehow, uh, I think he had the goodwill of the people. Uh, as, uh, as has been mentioned by some of the uh, people here, people actually feel like they have something they're gaining. There's an incentive for participating because the governor has made it in such a way that they feel that they're gaining something from it, I guess. Uh, I think it's, what's her name? I can't, uh, she was from the LSE, yeah. Learning School oh, of Economics sorry. here. Yeah, yeah. so Sarah. Yeah, so yeah, so she was talking about just like Eve about uh financial constraints and the whole issue of budgeting again. Uh it's interesting because I've seen what they actually do, they go to where the people are. And if you find like some of the photos of the governor, he actually sits down with the people. So uh, I think they try to make it as in as inexpensive as possible, reduce the cost of going to places where people meet and ensuring that if they meet and they uh, present their views or they take part and participate in the whole process, then there are greater incentives that they, that they receive. There's some benefit to it. So I guess that's a good thing for them. Yeah. Great, thanks. So we have um, three more questions. So I'll turn it to Alex first. Hey, um, thanks very much for the paper. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I was just thinking about the sort of suggestions that you got from Adrian and Ken at the beginning about sort of how to kind of move forward with the research. And one thing that I thought of, and maybe relating a little bit to Adrian's comments about how this could be, you know, just a McClenny paper, um, is thinking about how well kind of qualitative interviews could really help to kind of flesh it out, right? If you went down to people who work in civil society, people who have made petitions, kind of been there on the ground and been doing these sorts of things and just got their experiences and kind of, you know, maybe even showed them the ladder and say, you know, where does this work? Is this how it works? How does it kind of go about? And I feel like that would add a huge amount of richness to the paper. Um, in a really good way. I don't know how possible it is to do okay. research like that right now, but you know, there's always mm -hmm. a phone and you can get in touch with mm -hmm. people that way in these weird times, but I, I think that would, yeah, bring something okay. very, very Thank cool you. to the paper. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I'll, I'll take your question as well. Great, thanks. And thank you so much, Ruth, for sharing your work. Um, this is, it's, it's really interesting, and I think that you've gotten suggestions for about four different possible papers that you could write <laughs> out of this. So I think, you know, my, uh, my comment and suggestion in terms of focusing on, on this, and so the, fir the first thing that you, should, you might think about writing, um, I, I think that you need to decide what question you want to answer first. And it seems like the, the most obvious first question is, does devolution actually work for improving citizen participation? Um, and if so, who does it work for? You, you mentioned, and I think either Sarah or Eve mentioned this as well, there's a couple lines at the very end about how some people's voices are not heard as loudly. Um, and we know that uh, gender, age, and local status has a really big effect on whether or not you can participate in these processes. So I would think that you know, if you could take Alex's suggestion and maybe talk to a few people and sort of flesh out, uh, here's how devolution works in one place, um, here's who it works for, and these are the specific lived experiences, that that could be a really great first paper. And then, like I mentioned, you've got ideas for about four other follow-ups thinking about devolution. Um, but I think that if you pursue that type of approach, you know, Arnstein's Ladder, I think that this is a good analytical framework for you to use, but I'm not sure about using it as the motivating question. I would think the question is, how does devolution work? And then Arnstein's Ladder is the framework for analysis as you're going through and thinking about these processes. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Erin. Okay, thank you. Um, 
so Franklin, if you wanted, I was wondering if you wanted to to kind of discuss your question or comment, um, and if you do, uh, I'll let you go and then turn it over to Ruth. Otherwise, okay, Ruth, I'll just let you respond to both Aaron and Alex's comments, and we're running out of out, out of time here. So, um, and anything else you might want to address? Okay. Um... Thank you. Um, I, I didn't think about the four papers, but I suppose mm -hmm. it's possible. <laughs> um, I think my maybe it didn't come out so clearly, but it's true. I was thinking of devolution as the actual base, but uh, the ladder of participation as a framework, like to explain whether it works or not. Yeah, so thank you for that, Erin. And Alex, I think, I guess it would be interesting to try and do some interviews. I don't know if it would work, maybe on the, on the phone, uh, given, okay, now we have cessation of movement. So maybe moving uh, to, Mac to Macquen would not be so hard, but I, to get someone to agree to talk with you in Corona times would be a bit difficult. So I guess we will try the phone. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, particularly Ruth. Thank you so much for sharing your work with with us. Really appreciate it. It's incredibly mm -hmm. interesting. Um, and I do encourage kind of anyone who might be willing to read other drafts or if you have other comments to reach out to Ruth directly. Um, I know this is kind of a short period of time that we have to discuss this. So um please do reach out to Ruth directly. I also really want to th thank Ken and Adrian for taking the time to provide really thoughtful comments and discussion um, and really appreciate your contributions and thank you everyone to, for being here today. Um, so we are holding two other uh, summer colloquiums, so one at the end of this month and one in August. So I encourage everyone to, to sign up and to join those as well. Um, I also want to highlight, particularly for any graduate students that are with us today, that Joseph Goldens, who is an assistant professor at the University of, um, of Minnesota, I keep wanting to say other University of Minnesota is holding a two day workshop on crafting the job talk or academic presentations more broadly. So if that is of interest to you, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to him or to me directly and I will send, um, send that information to you. So for anyone that that might be interesting for. But again, thank you all so much for being here. And Ruth, thank you so much for, for sharing with us uh, your, your work, really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank okay. you. Bye.